Shalom, shalom, shalom. Uh, Y'all know we don't celebrate these holidays or none of that stuff, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, as you can tell, I wasn't really trying to do a lesson today. I'm relaxed. I'm in my re re relaxed state, chilling, uh, actually going over and my Bible stuff and creating notes, right? But... A brother had a question about Matthew 5. So I want to go over Matthew 5 for him uh, because uh, I was talking about covenants. And for some reason, he wants to disagree with me, which I don't mind. I don't mind the disagreeing. I don't mind that at all. But let's try to represent scriptures correctly. Let me tag the brother real fast. Sorry, y'all. This is for all my a law of Moses lovers. Okay? All my people that love the law of Moses. This is what I'm finna do. I'm finna break down what Matthew 5 was talking about when Christ said, Think not, I am come to destroy the law of the prophets, because people want to run to that and use that for pretty much everything. So, here's my YouTube channel, A-O-S-D-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R, where I give you all the information that you need, you would ever want, and et cetera. Uh, once again, you know, just bear with me. So, now we go. All right. Now, Mr. James, here we go. Let's go through uh, what you asked of me so I can go ahead and explain it real fast. Let's go through what you asked of me so I can go ahead and explain it. Uh, you said, brother, can I ask you how do you get the writing of the law in our minds and hearts into just meaning follow the word? And it says, ah, can you explain Matthew 5? With when Christ with his own word said until heaven and earth passes away, and that to whoever do teach will be the greatest, and etc. Right? So, this is, uh, I believe, your means to say that uh, somehow Christ came to do away with a certain part of a covenant, first of all, that he couldn't even do away because I did a video yesterday explaining the three different types of covenants, which was your grant, your kinship, and your vassal. Israel ended with the law of Moses under a vassal covenant. Covenants cannot be altered in the middle of a covenant. Impossible. Uh, the covenant bearer must die, and when the covenant bearer dies, then the new covenant comes. But the new covenant from the vassal uh, covenant did not switch over when Joshua died, and it was taken on by you know uh, Ezra and etc. The new co that covenant that dealt with the law of Moses it never changed. The new covenant was going to be the change when they went back to the grant covenant. But besides that, there's just a breakthrough, a breakdown. Let's go over Matthew 5, where people try to run to, uh, trying to use Christ to teach a continuation of the law of Moses. So we're going to read what exactly what Christ said specifically. Not what anybody doctrine tried to say in 2019, 2020. Let's see what Christ literally said dealing with the law of Moses, okay? He said, Matthew 5 and 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. So there's two things he did not come to destroy. It was the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. To fulfill what? The law and the prophets. Now look at verse 18. He specifically tells you, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one stipulation, one jot or in one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law, till what Christ? Until all be fulfilled. See, 
This is what we do when we try to teach a continuation of the law. Christ gave the timeline when the jots and tittle would pass from the law. He literally says it right here, till heaven and earth pass. So that's what people will think he's talking about, literal heaven and earth. We can actually break that down and what that means in just a second. Because we can actually go to Isaiah 13, and it shows you what heavens and earths are uh, to the most high. But anyway, heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. There will be the law passing till all be fulfilled. So Christ is saying the law cannot pass until all was fulfilled. So he said this. While he was still alive, before they knew he was the Messiah, while he was on the mount teaching uh, the congregation, and notice he wasn't saying anything about the law, so now they're looking at him wondering why come this prophet is, or this, this, this teacher is up there not talking about the law. So he explained to them he's not coming to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So now, Christ's word was, Till all be fulfilled, then the jots and tittles would pass from the law. So now, when was all fulfilled? When was all fulfilled? Well, you go to Luke 24, after Christ resurrected. Let's go to Christ's words himself. Luke, you see this red right here? This means Christ. So when we go to Luke 24, start at verse number... Let me find it. Um, uh, let's see here. 44. It says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. So he's teaching, he's teaching the conversation he had before the, uh, what, with them before he died, before he resurrected. He's touching right back on that conversation in Matthew chapter 5, 17 and 18. So listen to what he says. That all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, that's the law, and in the prophets. He said, think, let's go back to what he said now, Matthew 5, so we don't lose anybody. Matthew 5, 16, 17, and 18. I mean, sorry, 17 and 18. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come, I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. One jot of one tiller shall not pass until all be fulfilled. So now we have the context again. You go right back to Luke 24, 44, the same conversation. He says, these are the words which I spake with you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And look what he says right here, verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. So Christ himself, not my doctrine, your doctrine, anybody, not the Jewish man doctrine that the Hebrew Israelites uh, actually adopted and put and put their own little spin on it. Not any of that thing to do to deal with Judaism and the Judaizer. Christ said in the beginning, the law will not pass till all things be fulfilled. And then when Christ resurrected, he said, all things had been fulfilled, and you guys are witnesses to it. So now, if Christ said all things had to be fulfilled before the law passed, and then Christ comes when he resurrected and said all things were fulfilled, 
What does that mean about the law? This is what happened when we want the law of Moses over Christ. We teach the law, a continuation of the law, when Christ himself told you when the law was going to get ready to pass away. So, this is what Paul came in and Paul started talking about when people try to run to Paul. Oh, you misunderstanding Paul. Paul's stuff is hard to, no, it's not hard. It's not hard to, to understand another thing. The reason the problem was hard for the people back then is because they was doing the law of Moses for 1,500 years, and they wasn't understanding when this guy was coming in telling the, the uh, northern kingdom, you guys don't have to do the law no more. It's just for the Jews right now. The Jews right now is doing the law because they still had to wait on the temple to be destroyed before the old covenant was taken out. But this is prophecy, prophecy things. So now, let's discuss this heaven and earth passing away because for some reason people think this is literal heaven and earth so we have to use the bible to explain the bible so let's go to isaiah 13 dealing with the judgment of babylon right and we're just going to read down um let's see here let's go let me see something about some heavens and earth it's here somewhere Yes, so when he stirred the meads up, does it start in one? The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift up a banner above, upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they might go into the gates of the noble. I'm going to skip to four, the noise of a multitude in the mountains. I'm not going to read that one. Let me find it. Destroy the whole land. It should be right, hold on, it should not, it should not where it goes, man. I thought I just saw it. Uh, here we go, what does it say about heaven? Here we go, right here, 13, 13. All right, so here, let's get the backstory. The burden gets Babylon, right? Now, verse four. The noise of a multitude in the mountain, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustered the host of the battle. So just like the kings of all nations were supposed to come against Jerusalem and Armageddon, this actually happened against the, uh, the Babylons too, to let you know this is just Hebrew language, not to be taken literal as in every kingdom. But anyway. They should come from afar off from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Notice what's being destroyed, the land, right? The judgment against Babylon, the land is being destroyed. And as it keeps reading, how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. So the day of the Lord is coming to destroy the land of Babylon, right? So, uh, and then you have 13.8, you have the travailing and pain, which is the same thing Christ was saying, dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem. But now, verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, he says it again, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Destroy who? The sinners. I thought sin was transgression of the law, and only Israel had the law. So how could Babylon have sinners in it? Well, let's keep going. This is just ridiculous Hebrew Israelite like doctrine. And I love you, my brothers and sisters, but your doctrine is off. But now, look at verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give off their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Then this, and this is the same uh, uh, terminology that Christ used, talking about him coming, his second coming. The stars will fall from heaven. The sun will stop shining. Uh, the moon will not give off her light, and etc. This is all language dealing with battle. This is all talking about war. It's not talking about literal things happening. So now, verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I thought it was only Babylon being punished. Why is he saying now he's punishing the world? Because it's the world of Babylon. And I will cause the arrogancy 
of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Look what he says, and I will make a man more precious than fine gold. They said the same thing dealing with the war of the Jews, even as a go, even as a man with the golden wedge is offered. So now look, verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. What is he shaking? The heavens and the earth are removing. The heaven is leaving. The heaven is shaking. The earth is removing. He's destroying the heavens and earth. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. What's happening in verse 14? And it shall be as one chase row, and as a sheep that no man take it, that every man should turn on his own people and flee everyone into his own land. I thought he's destroying the earth and shaking the heavens. How are people able to still be ready? Because the heaven and earth being destroyed is that land being destroyed. The heaven and earth belongs to a kingdom. When he said, now, hopefully we understand now this is about a kingdom, not literal heaven and earth. So once we go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, let's read what Christ is saying. Think not I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till the kingdom of Jerusalem pass, one jot and one tiller should not pass from the law till everything I came to do be fulfilled. This is what he's saying. He's not saying literal heaven and earth had to be destroyed. And he's not saying that the law of Moses was going to continue. That's not, that's what people in 2019, 2020 try to teach because they learn from the Khazars and still have learned to go into the Bible and actually understand what the Bible is saying by using the Bible. So no, no, no. That law wasn't supposed to stay around. Only thing the Father wanted you to do was trust and believe on Christ and you will receive everlasting life. Christ said, y'all uh, search the scriptures for life but the scriptures is actually talking about me. So this is what we're supposed to be doing. So now he said, and I will, and I don't know why we would go to Revelation 21 like it's saying anything different. Le Revelation 21. And I saw a new, it, it actually tells you what it is. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there was no more sea. Notice he said, a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the first earth was gone. And look what it says. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. New what? New Jerusalem. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. So guess what? Old Jerusalem was destroyed. That's the only way to see something new. The old had to leave. He saw new Jerusalem because old Jerusalem was destroyed. That's what it says. I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem. So the new heaven and the new earth is actually new Jerusalem. The first heaven and the first earth was actually old Jerusalem. So this is why when you go to Matthew 24, Christ is telling them right here, Matthew 24 and 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Talking about the destruction of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. You go to Matthew 23 and verse number 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thou children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. This was all about warfare. This is the old Jerusalem being destroyed. You go to Luke 21, it tells you the same thing. Luke 21, all about the same thing. And as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. You go down to Luke 20, and when you see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. What is happening? Jerusalem is being destroyed. 
Then let those which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and not them just enter into the country. Uh, they should not enter into. For these be the days of vengeance. What will be when Jerusalem is being destroyed? What's going to happen? That all things which are written may be fulfilled. So Christ said it right there. All things was going to be fulfilled. Uh, they're 23, wrapped upon his people, 24, and they should fall by the edge of the sword and should be led away captive into all nations. And, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Who? Jerusalem shall be trodden down. And people will tell you the time of the Gentiles is still now because there's Gentiles in Jerusalem. That's because they don't know scriptures. Once you go to Revelation chapter 11, it tells you right here the same prophecy in vision form. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city, the what? The holy city, Jerusalem, they should tread underfoot 40 and two months, three and a half years, time times and a half. This is all this is about. It says it right here, 1,203 score days, 42 months. The time of the Gentiles was 42 months. That's how long it took Rome to destroy Jerusalem. From 66 AD to 70 AD. That's all it is. So this whole new Jerusalem coming down, the new heavens and earth, was actually representing spiritual Jerusalem because old covenant Jerusalem was passed away. If you say it can't be spiritual Jerusalem, you go to Hebrews chapter 12, um, verse number 21. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly quake in fear. But you are coming to Mount Zion and into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The new heavens and the new earth was the heavenly Jerusalem. The people in Hebrews was already going into the heavenly Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth, which had an innumerable company of angels, and it actually tells you what it is. The general assembly, the church of the firstborn. The new heaven and the new earth was the church of the firstborn, the general assembly, which was the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. So no, no, no. The law wasn't supposed to last forever. It was only until Jerusalem was being destroyed, which happened first century, and Christ's sacrifice brought in everything needed for that old covenant to pass away. That is it, point blank period. There's nothing else to actually talk about. <laughs> so that is it. Brother says, so no more need for repenting according to what you said. I did not say that. I told you the law of Moses, the law of Moses was done away with. If you want to talk about repenting, this is why they was repenting. Let's go to why they was repenting. You go to Matthew chapter 2, I believe. Let's see here. Uh, might have been Matthew chapter 3. Here we go right here. And in, in the days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judas and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They was repenting for the kingdom of heaven. They wasn't repenting talking about the law of Moses. That, that's not, in fact, he was actually talking to the people that was using, uh, that was actually in the law of Moses. He was telling those people doing the law of Moses to repent. And then for the Pharisees and the Sadducees who actually did the law of Moses, this is what he told them. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to the baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He was telling those law followers that the wrath was going to come upon them. Christ told those law followers that the wrath was going to come upon them. It was never about the law of Moses. The Father did not want them to give them the law of Moses. In fact, Paul let it be known the law of Moses only came because of transgression. The law of Moses was not the Father's plan for Israel. He wanted them to be a king a kingdom of kings and priests, which was a great covenant. And then they told, he said, all you have to do is follow my voice. Then Israel responded, hey, Moses, uh, we want to listen to you, and you tell us what the Father said. 
And since that happened, the Father gave them the Ten Commandments, which was a grant covenant. So then they disobeyed the Ten Commandments. So the Father gave them the additional law, which was a vassal covenant because of that transgression of the grant covenant. So once they received the vassal covenant, the Father made sure he could put them back under a grant covenant, which was only faith-based, the same covenant that Abraham and Noah had, faith-based covenants. And so Christ brought in a faith-based covenant. Repenting has nothing to do with the law of Moses. Never had anything to do with the law of Moses, and it never will have anything to do with the law of Moses. The law of Moses only created bondage, and people love being under bondage, and they love rules. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. They love rules. They hate freedom. Christ brought back freedom. So you don't need the law of Moses to be free. You only need Christ. So that is it. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you would like the verses, just ask and I will go through. But we should know right now as Bible scholars that Paul said uh, the law of Moses came because of the transgressions. So we should know that. So is, is there anything that uh, uh, else that I need to cover? Let me know now if we have any more questions. Galatians 3 and 19. Well, let's start at 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not and he, and he said, not into seeds as of many, but as one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That was the point, Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years, cannot disannul, cannot get rid of, that it should make the promise of none effect. So the point was the promise, not the law. For if the inheritance, he tells you right here, for if the inheritance be of the law, if you can get the kingdom of heaven through the law, it is no more of promise. It would not be a promise if you could receive it through the law. But God gave it to Abraham, who was not under the law of Moses, by promise, not dealing with the law of Moses, only through faith. So now we have a question mark here. Wherefore then serve the law? Why do we serve the law? What was the point of the law? It was added because of transgressions. Why was it, was it something the Most High wanted to do no, it was added because of transgressions, because of sin, because of Israel's sinful nature, sinful nature. It's not the Most High's plan. He did not want to give it to him. He had a promise already, the promise that through the seed, everybody will be blessed. They will inherit the land. So now we find out that the law came because of transgressions. And how long was the law? Till the seed should come. When was the law? Till. A lot of people, we for some reason, we leave out all of these tills. People overlook all of these tills left and right. Till the seed should come. Till when? The seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who was the promise? Christ. What for servant the law? Because of transgressions. How long was it going to be enacted? Till the seed should come to the promise to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Mm. So hopefully we see that the law never was the plan. It had an end date. Christ told us the end date. Paul told us the end date. So why are you in 2019, 2020 still talking about the law of Moses and what you're supposed to be doing when we clearly have scripture telling us when the law was going to end? 
And you keep saying we're not, uh, I'm not saying that we're under the law. It's still our friend and his holy. Uh, no. Christ is our friend and his holy. The law was holy to the people that was under the law that could not do it. You are not under the law. You are under Christ. Christ is the law. Well, if I say Christ is the law, I guess I got to show where Christ is the law then, right? So now, let me open my Bible to Isaiah, right? Let's show you that Christ was the law. We go to Isaiah. Uh, I think it's 40, now 51, I think. Isaiah 51, and then we're going to go to uh, 49, and then we're going to go to the law. Okay, Isaiah 51. Let's prove that Christ actually was the law that the Most High was going to write on people's heart. It was going to be Christ. So let's go to Isaiah 51. Let's see if we can find it here. Isaiah 51. I'm looking down at myself too, legit. So it might be different in the King James Version. So Isaiah 51, let's go to 3. Let me see here. Listen to me. Nope. It's different in my Septuagint. So let me find it uh, in the King James Version. Let's see. 51 and... Yeah, that's it right there. This word is different. 51 and 4. Hearken unto me, my people, this is Israel, and give ear unto me, O nation. For a law shall proceed from me. A what? A law. See, these people was already under the law of Moses. So now, a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth, and my arm shall judge the people. So now what do we have? The law proceeding. And what is the law going to do? Make judgment to rest for the light. What is the law? Righteousness, salvation, the arm. But let's keep going to show you that Christ indeed was this law. You go to uh, Isaiah 49 now. Isaiah 49, verse 6. And, I, and he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So this person that was going to be a light to the Gentiles, he came in, and we find out that this same salvation and person is the same law, right? Look what the law is going to do. It's going to be a salvation and a light to the Gentiles. It's going to be a light to the people. You go to Luke. Two. What is it? Uh, Luke two. Thought it was forty. Let me see. Luke two right here. Thirty two. Oh well, let's start at verse thirty. I'll let you know they're talking about the same thing. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, the same salvation in Luke fifty one. Luke, I mean, sorry, Isaiah fifty one. Isaiah 49, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Who was he talking about? Christ. Christ was the salvation. He was the light to the Gentiles. And once you go back into Isaiah 5, I mean Isaiah 51, just to put it back all together again, Isaiah 51 
A law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people, a light to the Gentiles, a Christ. My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth. We have seen your salvation. This is what Luke 2 was saying. And my arm shall judge the people. This is all about Christ. A law shall proceed from me. Christ proceeded from the Father. The Spirit proceeded from the Father. 40. Nine, I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles. Who was this? Christ. That, that, that thou mayest be my salvation. Who was the salvation? Christ. Christ was the law. He was the salvation. And if you go to, hold on, give me one second. If you go to Isaiah 55, also Isaiah 55. What else is this person going to do? Three. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. So now we have the word. Incline your ear. Come unto me here and your soul shall live. We have life. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Of David. So what's happening? He's going to make an everlasting covenant with this person. And thou shalt call thy nations, uh, and thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, which was the Gentiles, and the nations that knew not thee shall run into thee because of the Lord thy God, which was the Gentiles, and for the Holy One of Israel he had glorified. So right, he's going to make a, a everlasting covenant with this person, right? Now Isaiah 49 again tells you, uh, think, hold on, let me see here. It's not Isaiah 49. Uh, yeah, Isaiah 49 and 6 right here. I already had it highlighted. Okay. That's not what it said. You need each other. It was a great thing about to restore the preserve of Israel, I will give you a light. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. This has got to be the next verse. Yeah, right here, verse 40, sorry, 49 and 8. Thus said the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a, in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. heritage. So now we see that that same individual, <laughs> bless me, sorry, that same individual was going to be the covenant. I will give thee for a covenant. So the individual was an everlasting covenant. He was receiving the covenant. He was the covenant. He was the law. He was the salvation and etc. All of this is Christ. So when the father said in Isaiah 51 again, a law shall proceed from me in Isaiah. And then we have Zechariah, sorry, Jeremiah, who comes after Isaiah. Jeremiah comes after Isaiah. And this is what Jeremiah says when he gets upon the scene. Isaiah, I mean, Jeremiah 31, and we know that this covenant is Christ, and this is exactly what he says. Thirty-three. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After that, after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will put my law in their inward parts, which is the same law in Isaiah 51, the same law in Isaiah 51. The same law in Isaiah 51. A law shall proceed from me. And if you go to actual uh, Ezekiel, 37. Uh, let's see here. I will open your graves and let you know. 
or was it 36? Therefore, I will multiply these. I will cause all men, neither men. Hold on, let me find it real fast. 36 and right here, 25. Let me highlight these so I know. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away your stony flesh out of your flesh and give you a new heart, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. This is all about Christ being put inside of the people. Christ came with his word. He left, allowing the Holy Spirit to come in, which was a representation of Christ. This is all this is. Law of Moses, done away with, gone. The new law was Christ. Christ brought forth the gospel, which enabled the people to get the Holy Spirit to be taught. The Father said, I will teach you. Christ then comes. After the Father says, I will teach you. The Father said, no man will teach you, for I will teach you. You go to John 14, 26. But the Comforter which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Who? The Holy Spirit shall teach you all things. Go back to Jeremiah 31. 31. Where it says right here, 31, 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. We know Christ was the covenant. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward part and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. Who should not do this? People will not teach every man uh, his neighbor. Why? Why would people not do? Why would people stop doing the teaching? Uh, John 14, 26, because the Holy Spirit was going to be doing the teaching. And they was going to teach all things. I mean, the Holy Spirit was going to teach all things, not man. Man wasn't going to teach anybody anything anymore. This is what they had to do in the law of Moses. I think that is, um, I think Nehemiah 6. Oh, let me, let me look at my Bible. That was a guess. But let me show you, hold on, all right, and they, and they, and they to the, Nehemiah 8, 8. And three. And he read therein before the streets that was before. Let's start at two. No, no, let's start at one. And all the people gathered together, themselves together, as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding until upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand and all ears of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Look how long he taught them, from the morning until midday. And Ezra the scribe stood upon the pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And then it tells all the people that stood before him. 
And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And also uh, uh, Jeshua and Benai and all these names right here, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Who was doing the teaching here? Mankind. What was they doing? They was teaching Israel, the Levites, was teaching Israel the law of the Most High. John, Christ comes around and says, no more, because now the Holy Spirit will teach you the law, which was the things pertaining to Christ. So the law is done away with. Not, not because they was written in you. Christ is written in you. Christ gives you life. Christ is the one that gives you life. Nobody else but Christ. In fact, let's see what he says. Let's see what he says about uh, that. John 5, 39. Let's start at verse 38. And ye have not, well, 37. And the Father himself, which have sent me, had borne witness of me. Ye have heard not his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent. Him ye believe not. So these people had the law of Moses. They knew the law of Moses. And Christ said, you don't have the word of the Father within you. And then he keeps going and saying, search the scriptures. For in them, ye think ye have eternal life. They thought they had eternal life from the scriptures. And they are they which testify of me. Christ said the scriptures is actually talking about him. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Where did life come from? Christ. Where did life come from? Christ. Christ. Not the law of Moses. Christ. No law. Christ. Christ is the law. In the new covenant, life is through Christ. All you had to do was believe on Christ. That's all you had to do. So simple. I mean, so simple. I said simple. So simple. <laughs> and if you go through, I think, what? John eleven twenty five, 25. And I will end it with this. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth, what all you got to do? Believe in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. What all you got to do, Christ? Believe. What all you got to do in the new covenant, Christ? Believe. If we believe on you, Christ, what do we do? He shall live. And whosoever liveth and believeth, what do they got to do, Christ? Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Look how many times he said believe. 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 Notice he did not bring the one law of Moses. He didn't say anything about the law of Moses needed in order to get life. In fact, everybody knew that the law bringeth forth death. Christ said, believe on me, you will live. This is what was happening in Revelation. 
I think it's chapter 19. Uh, no, Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse number 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What is this actually talking about? What is this vision talking about? It's talking about those people putting on Christ, believing on Christ. Therefore, death had no more power over them. So death was being destroyed. Death was being destroyed because they believed on Christ. You go to 2 Timothy, I think it's 4 and 16, maybe? Nope, definitely not. Four and sixteen, uh, maybe three and sixteen. Nope. What is it? Four and thirteen. Let me find it real fast in my Bible. And if you know it, just put it down. When it says what Christ did with death, it's in Second Timothy. Let me. Um, oh, sorry. I was all the way off. 2 Timothy 1 and 10. I was all the way off. 1 and 10. Well, let's go to 9. Who had... Let's start at 7. For God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. What did they get? The power of love and sound mind. Power, love, sound mind. But not thou, therefore, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. What is the law of Moses all about? Works. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. What? Purpose and grace. New covenant thing. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. What? Given in who? Christ Jesus. Purpose and grace. Christ Jesus. Now look what it says. 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality? How were we getting life and, and immortality? To life through the gospel. The who? The, God, the law of Moses? The gospel. Christ abolished death. If you put on Christ, you join immortality. You put on a new body. So in Revelation 20, death was being cast into the lake of fire because it no longer reigned over mankind because Christ was reigning inside the body. This is all it is. So that's what it is. And people want to do, they want to think that you got to do something physical in order to get life, in order to be part of the kingdom. You have to be doing the law of Moses. When we understand that the strength of sin is death and sin is the transgression of the law. So if Christ came to do away with sin and sin was transgression of the law and death came because of the law, who got his strength from sin, and we see death being cast into the lake of fire, what does that mean about sin in the law of Moses? It had to leave. It had to be abolished. It had to go away through Christ. This is what the Bible is teaching. So I don't know why the people want to be in the law of Moses or want to do the law and feel like the law is going to be here to stay. And the only way the Most High see you is through the law. He did not want to give Israel the law. The law came because of transgression. This is why he had to send Christ. This is why a new covenant was sought after. 
If the old covenant was good, he would not have to give you a new covenant. The old now, what did the old covenant have? In it? The old covenant had the sacrificial systems. It had uh, the, the Ten Commandments, and it had the rest of the law with the blessings and the curses. If that was what the Most High wanted, he would have not made a new covenant. And in the new covenant, it's all based off of faith in Christ. He made it so simple that even a caveman can do it. But people don't want to do it because they want to feel like that their self-righteousness bring them to Christ. Bring, bring them to the Most High. Bring them to the kingdom. No. The new covenant brings you there. So that's it. That is that. And brother, I am not misrepresenting you. I read exactly what you said. You said, but the Most High put his laws in us to teach us by the ways of the Holy Spirit. He did not say his law was different from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the law. Christ is the law. All things pertaining to Christ in the Spirit is the law. There, there's no more. In fact, uh, let's see. I think it's in First John. Hold on, let me find it real fast. Let me find it. How Christ said, because when people misuse If you love me, keep my commandments, right? Well, let me find out what that said. If you love me, keep my commandments. What does that say? If you love me, keep my What is that? John 14, 15. All right, here we go right here. I found it. John 14 and 15, right? This is what people do. People do it right here. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, how long? Forever. Even the spirit of truth. What was going to come? The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. What was they doing? The law of Moses. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, the people who follow Christ. For he dwelleth in you. Hold on now. The Father dwelleth in you. He was going to put the law where? In them. And shall be in you. But this is what people do. They run right here and say, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's telling you that the only way to love the Father is you got to do the commandments that was in the law of Moses. Right? That's what they that's what they run to. But then we forget that there is a first John. And the way they use first John is uh Whosoever committed, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, sin is transgression of the law. I think that's in uh, 1 John. Yeah, First John 3 and what is it? 1 John 3 and 4. All right, 1 John 3 and 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also of the law, for sin is the transgression of the law, right? And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in, in him is no sin. So what is this saying right here? If sin is transgression of the law, and Christ came to take away sin, what did Christ have to do away with? Once again, if sin is transgression of the law, and he came to do away with sin, what did he have to do away with? Did he have to do away with the law or anything else? Of course he had to do away with the law because the law is what caused sin. But anyway, and ye know that he, he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Whosoever abided in him sinneth not. 
If you are in Christ, you cannot sin, you sin not. Whosoever sinned had not seen him, neither known him. So if you abide in Christ, you sin not. Where does sin? Transgression of the law. You can't transgress something that's not in Christ. But anyway, so people will go through that, right? And they was like, see, you got to do the commandments. But once you go down, actually, to verse 22, look at what he says. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments, right? If you love him, you will keep his commandments. We keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So now, if this is talking about the commandments in the law of Moses, it should say it, correct? But he literally tells you what it is, the next verse. And this is his commandment. That we should believe, once again, believe that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So what was the commandment? We should, what was the commandments that we're supposed to be doing? We should believe on the name of his son, faith. And love one another. Love. And he that keepeth his commandments, not the law of Moses' commandments, but these commandments, dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abided in us by the spirit which he had given us. They had received the spirit. They were believing on the son and they was loving. This is the commandments that, that you were supposed to do. And none of these commandments is nothing carnal. This is all inwardly things. Love inwardly. Believe inwardly. Christ inwardly. The Father inwardly. The Holy Spirit inwardly. The new laws written on your heart inwardly. All things in the new covenant was inwardly. Nothing about the law of Moses ever gets brought up. Dealing with life. Nothing. Nothing about the law of Moses ever get brought up in the new covenant. This is what old covenant people are doing. So then, one more, and then I will really be done. Revelation 14 and 12. What people love running to, too. Revelation 14 and 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith, what? Faith, what? Faith of Jesus. So now they want to make you think that this is talking about the Ten Commandments given in the law of Moses. They want you to believe that this is talking about the Ten Commandments just because they see the word commandments. They automatically go to the Ten Commandments, right? Just because they see the word commandments. Well, let's see here. Once you go back to 1 John 3, 23, we see with those that believe in Christ what commandments they were doing. They were believing on the name of Christ and they were loving one another. These are the faith of those people that's keeping those commandments, not the Ten Commandments. And I know I keep saying this is going to be the last one, but this is really the last one. You go to Genesis 26 and 5, Genesis 26 and 5. It literally says, I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. Why? Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So I want you to go into Genesis 26, 25, 24, and show me where Abraham kept the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> show me the Ten Commandments was listed and Abraham kept them. It literally said that Abraham's uh, faith was counted toward righteousness. 
The commandments that Abraham kept was the sayings of the Most High. He did what the Most High said. <clears throat> he wasn't doing the Ten Commandments. So, and Abraham had his own covenant. The New Covenant had, is its own sets of rules and violate I mean, regulations. So, no, the Law of Moses has been done away with. Over with. Over with. Over. And thank y'all for listening. So, yeah. It's not a really a agree to disagree. And I hate saying this to my brothers and sisters. But for some reason, our pride has us. It's not a agree to disagree moment. It is a right and wrong moment. If we're both saying different things. One of us right and the other is wrong. The only difference is I'm going in the Tanakh as well as the New Testament showing what the law was and how Christ himself said when the law of Moses was going to be complete, be done away with. So, if you want to do the law of Moses, that's on you. That's not going to please the Father because we saw what pleased the Father. We was there, right here, 1 John 3.23, and this is, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, and keep, and, and he, as he gave us commandment, and he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. This is letting the Father tabernacle with you. And hereby we know that he abided in us by the spirit which he gave us. So look, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. What's pleasing in the most high sight? That we believe on the son, Jesus Christ, and that we love one another. This is why people are is not getting their blessings. This is why they feel that their prayers isn't working. This is why they're running to the law of Moses, thinking that the Father is going to give them something because they're doing all kind of righteous stuff. Look, Father, I'm doing your law. Look, I'm not eating poor. Look, I'm doing the Sabbath day. I told my job. I The job that you gave me, I put it at risk because I told them I can't work on the Sabbath. I'm doing all the things you told me to do. So now, please bless me and answer my prayers. Why aren't your prayers been answered? Well, there's not enough people doing the law of Moses yet. We as a nation, in order for us as a nation to be delivered, we all got to come together and do the law of Moses. No. The reason why your prayers aren't been answered is because of this. You're not believing on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and you're not loving one another. You're going out teaching hate. You're telling people how they're less than, than you because of your bloodline, which you can and can't be. You're going around telling your brothers and sisters they don't understand the Bible because they don't keep the law of Moses. You're, you're, just, you're showing so much hatred. You're telling people, oh, look at you. You're wicked because you don't got on fringes. Uh, the Most High is going to come destroy America. It's going to destroy you. It's going to blah, blah, this and that, showing all that hatred. None of that is love, and you have a nerve to say it's love because you're speaking the word of God. See, I'm just saying the word of God, and I'm saying how he's saying it. Uh, judge, righteous judge. No, you're speaking hatred. It's in your heart. The Father is not able to tabernacle with you. You don't have the spirit because you think that you can do all kind of uh, uh, carnal things in order to get on his radar. And the Bible actually tells you what you got to do. So no, your prayers ain't been answered because you're not doing what he told you to do. I don't have that problem. So that's what it is. That's what it is. I didn't say you were I'm talking about it in general. But now if you want to come learn with us, Hey, shoot me your, uh, your, your information, and, and, and we can talk on the phone. Inbox me your information if you want to come learn with us. Not, not, not come argue, because I'm not going to argue with nobody. Uh, it's too much. I know too many scriptures to argue. Uh, I mean, and I'm not being uh, 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 
uh, bullheaded or pigheaded or, or, or arrogant or none of that. But in my group, the people I fellowship with, we study, study, study. That's all we do, study. So, I mean, we, we, we don't have time really pretty much to argue because we're studying and we're knowing actually what we're saying is, 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 is found. It's true. So that's what we're doing. So if you want to uh, uh, study with us, man, let's hit me up, man. I can get you to my elder and everything. My elder just came from, uh, from uh, Africa spreading the good news. But once again, I'm not like other brothers anyway because we teach the whole Bible has been fulfilled. Uh, we teach Christ came back first century. And we teach people to quit looking at the sky because it ain't happening because we are in the kingdom of heaven already. So, you know, we teach a little different anyway. And that's why we can read the law of Moses how we read the law of Moses. We know it's been gone when the temple was destroyed. But, I mean, that's just what it is. If anybody got anything else to say, let me know. But the Bible says what the Bible says. You know, it teaches what it teaches. We don't have to do the law of Moses. We're not under that bondage. We're not under that death. We are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. And I I definitely would end it with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to end it with that. Because a lot of people don't understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. And the brother, brother, what you pointed out earlier, dealing with Revelation 21, I'm just, I just want to show you what Revelation 21 is actually about. So you got uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Let me just show you what it's about real fast. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Right? And when you look up that word creature right there, if it pops up, uh, that's not what I wanted. If you look up the word creature right there, creature, it means formation, literally, figuratively. It means a building, a creation, creature, or ordinance. Remember, it remember it's a building or creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new building or creation. All old things are passed away. All things are become new. So let's show you what's going on in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away. This is Jerusalem passing away. But now, what is the spiritual meaning behind it? If you are a new in Christ, you are a new creation. This is a new creation. Behold, all the old things have passed away. These are the old things passing away right here. Behold, all things become new. This is the new right here. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. And look at what, what Christ said. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, which is the new covenant promise, Jeremiah 31. So this is all this is talking about Jerusalem being destroyed, bringing in the new covenant for the world. So now, uh, let me find it. Jeremiah 31. I'm just showing you what it means to break down. Jeremiah 31. And I will put my laws in their inward part, writing on their heart in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That is the new covenant promise. You put on Christ, you become a new creation. You put you get a you become a new building, a new creation. Now he's able to tabernacle. He should be there, uh, they should be his people. And God himself should be their God, right? And remember he said, behold, uh, uh, you put on Christ, you become a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 
right? So now, look, he should wipe away all tears. There should be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Remember, old things are passing away, for the former things are passed away. You put on Christ, you become a new creature, a creation, a new building. Old things are passed away. See, look, former things are passed away. All things become new. And he said, and as he sat upon the throne said, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The book of Revelation, especially 21, uh, but Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem and the new covenant coming in. What you're seeing in Revelation 21 is actually people putting on Christ entering into the new covenant. All old things in their life are leaving, and all new things through Christ is coming. This is all that's happening. They're putting on the new covenant. All of their old things is passing away. All of the new things are coming. And this is why you go further down, you actually see the new building. This is all, all spiritual. But now, where is the thousand uh, year rule of Christ and the eternal life that I will get back to you with my brother? Okay, and I will show you real fast. Where is the uh, thousand year reign, right? Where is the thousand year reign? Uh, that is that Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Let's show you what this is actually talking about right here. No, I'm sorry, Revelation 20, sorry. All right, so first of all, these were the people that was beheaded. These are the people that was dying, right? So this would be the spiritual realm. But anyway, I want you to notice what it says. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, right? So now, these people are living and reigning with Christ a thousand years. You go to Revelation 1, 6, let's well, start at 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, and had made us kings and priests, so they was after the order of Melchizedek, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So now, how could they be kings and priests? How could they be kings if they wasn't ruling with Christ? How could the seven churches and John the Revelator be a king if they wasn't ruling with Christ? There are already kings in Revelation. Revelation 20 said they will rule and reign with him a thousand years. The rulership and reigning was already happen happening in Revelation chapter 1. So now, let's go now, sorry. Let's go now to First Corinthians fifteen twenty seven. And my mouse at right. So my mouse is tripping. All right, here we go. First Corinthians 15, 27. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But anyway, for he had put all things under his feet. But when he had said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. So right here, we have all things being under Christ. Ephesians 1, 22. 
and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. So Christ was already ruling and reigning. Hebrews 2, 8. That has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. But now uh, this is all about the subjection to Christ. We've got to understand these are different time periods, right? And hold on. Let me see something real fast. If ye believe, if ye did be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So we see that Christ was sitting on the right hand of God right there, which was in power. But I'm looking for one more thing. Let me see if I can find it. Try one more. That wasn't it, but I was looking for some. It's, it's one more. I'm trying to see. I don't think it is. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, now, here we go right here. Okay, okay. I thought I was tripping. I know there's one more. All right, I think I found it. No, never mind, never mind. I had to do some more. It, it, it was another verse that I was wanting to quit when it said that he uh, has brought all things in heaven and earth. Uh, it said something like heaven and earth is put in subjection to him or something. But you get what I'm saying, so. And this is going to bother me now. And if y'all know it, let me know. Maybe this is it right here. Yeah, here we go, right here. All right. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the 
dispensation. Ah, I missed that word. Dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So this is uh this was the plan that all things in heaven and earth was going to be gathered in Christ. And we see that when Christ resurrected, uh, all power was given. In fact, when he said, uh, that's the, after the resurrection. That was after the res resurrection. Uh, uh, Matthew 28, 18. That's it. That was after the resurrection. I just, the light popped off. 28 and 18. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now, this is after he resurrected. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So that's what we have. Finally, we got it. So now, all power, all authority was given to Christ when Christ resurrected. So he was already ruling as a king. And then in Revelation 1, we got it now. One and nine, sorry, one and six, has made us kings and priests. We see that mankind was already ruling and reigning with Christ. So there we have it. The thousand year reign, thousand just means uh, completion in, uh, to Hebrews, dealing with uh, numerology. There's a lot of numerology in the Bible, uh, like sevens and groups of threes and 144,000 and 12 tribes and etc. It's a lot of numerology. And 1,000 just represented completion. So it was saying that Christ was going to have a completed reign uh, or perfection, a perfect reign. That's all. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah, man. Thank you, Paul. I was, I was going through that one. Oh, Brother Chris, how you doing, man? I see you still don't believe all things have been fulfilled. But uh, we can talk about that another day. Uh, I'm glad that you admitted, though, that uh, Zechariah 12, uh, Revelation 1, and Matthew 24 is the same time period. So all you have to do is find uh, Zechariah 14 uh, and uh, Matthew 24. They're talking about the same time period with the destruction of the temple. But anyway, besides that. We have all power and sub subjection was given unto Christ. Revelation 1 and 6, we have John the Revelator and the seven churches already being considered kings. See, that hath made. Let me make sure that it's past tense. Made. Uh, primary to make, abide, execute. I don't say what tense it is. But we have hath which will be uh, past tense and made kings and priests. But right now, they was already kings and priests and they was ruling and reigning. And then uh, they was already sitting in heavenly places too. They was already in heaven. They was already in heaven. I think he said, and set us in heavenly places. Uh, Ephesians 2, 6. Ephesians 2, 6. Um, 5. And when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ, Quickened means made alive. We realize that they was made alive through the gospel. So this will be resurrection. Even when we were dead in sins, had resurrected us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and had raised us up together. So this is past tense. And made, this is past tense, us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there was already in the heavenly realm. They was already in the heavenly realm. And once again, I swear I'm done now, y'all. They was already reigning. They was already sitting in the heavenly realms in Jesus. They had already been resurrected in Jesus. 
uh, they got the spirit through Jesus. And when it said that they was in heavenly realm, this was dealing with uh, the church. Right here. But ye are not coming to Mount, but ye are coming to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So they was already in the heavenly Jerusalem. They was already in the heavenly places. They are, they was already around innumerable uh, company of angels, and and this was the general assembly and church of the firstborn. The church was the heavenly Jerusalem, which was the Mount Zion. And the members would have been the company of angels and etc. So it's all one thing representing something else. All new covenant. I am done now, y'all. I swear I'm done. We can call it a night. I like to say shalom. I am done. I'm done. I swear I'm done. So yes, the Bible has been fulfilled. Yes, the, resurre the resurrection occurred through Christ, through the Holy Spirit coming in. The law was written on our heart, which was Christ. Though we had to follow the word. The word was made flesh. The flesh came with the gospel. The gospel was uh, published, and we have it now in front of us called the New Testament, and we also can find it in the Old Testament. So the law is Christ. We believe on Christ. We love our neighbor. We please the Father. We ask the Father, wherever we, uh, for his blessings and, 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 and et cetera, we receive them. Trust me, I have literally received everything I have prayed for, literally. Literally receive everything I have prayed for. Literally. Let me say it one more time. Literally received everything I have prayed for. So, literally. I, the, I mean, literally. So, people, do what you're supposed to do, and everything will be okay. Now, my prayers don't go against it. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, Superman it, or I don't want to people be like, "Oh, he lied." So let me let me expound. As I pray, I ask the Father to make sure it's his will that I receive. And now, as of right now, everything has been his will because I have received it. So now, in the future, some things I pray for might not be his will. And he will say, no. But I pray, letting the Father know, if it's your will, Father, Please give your humble servant this, 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 and this. And, and on his time, he has came through with everything I have asked for. Uh, my, I'm sorry, my screen is blurry. Uh, this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through uh, 24. This goes along, this heavenly Jerusalem that the Hebrews were in 2,000 years ago is the same heavenly Jerusalem that came out of the sky in Revelation 21. The same heavenly Jerusalem that's in Isaiah 65, starting at verse 17. They're the same exact places. And Isaiah, I like Isaiah 65 because it actually gives you the whole breakdown of what we're supposed to be doing when the Father enters us and, and we'll be in the new heavens and the new earth through the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 65 actually explains it, what we're supposed to be doing. And you can read it because I said I am done. But you can read further on down and it just shows you that it's supposed to be peace among man, amongst mankind, which is, you know, the love your neighbor for it. All right. That's it, guys. Once again, once, I'm dressed like this because I was sitting back relaxing. And thank you, Brother James, for listening on. I know I'm not in my Hebrew get-up or I'm not presentable to most people, but what I was doing is I was transferring notes from my King James Bible unto my new Bible that has the Septuagint and the New King James Version in it. And I also have my, um, what I have on me for other notes. I have my Anti-Nicene Church Fathers. Um, I have my uh, commentary for the Book of Revelation here. 
I have my handbook for the New Testament and the Old Testament, connecting scriptures and etc. here. Of course, my apocrypha. And then I have my Josephus here to understand some of the history behind it. Uh, then I have my, sorry, I have my books dealing with understanding covenants and the law of Moses. I have my covenant book here, and I have my covenant book there to look at it. And then I have uh, Max King's new books uh, dealing with uh, Romans and etc. So I do this like I set this up. Once again, I know I'm not in a good get up, but I just want everybody to know, you know the people that I talk to at the Resurrect, uh, the Assembly of Sound Doctrine, as well as the, the group that we're starting, RPK stands for Resurrection Prophecy Kingdom. Uh, we take this stuff seriously. You know, we we actually sit down and try to put in the work to understand exactly what the Bible is saying. We're not here to teach any wind of doctrine. We're here putting in this work. I'm off of work for two weeks, and you better believe I have been putting in work all day, every day. My wife left with the kids. She's like, you know, hey, just go and do your thing. I know this is what you're going to do. So I've been putting in work, making notes, trying to understand more and more what the Bible is teaching. So yes, we put in work. We read in context. We read chapters. We read whole books of the Bible as well as other commentary, etc., in order to formulate a better understanding of the Bible. So I don't know what people's personal uh, or drive is or what whoever they listen to or whatever doctrine that they're being taught, but we are trying to get the best understanding that we can so we can understand the kingdom of heaven more. We're not worried about the law of Moses. We're not worried about Christ coming back in our future. We are understanding that fulfillment has happened and what we're supposed to do in order to further the kingdom, to bring more of the kingdom on earth, as well as different ways and methods and stuff that we can talk and teach people that want to learn and listen. So we go through all of this stuff, and we will debate. We will defend the gospel. So thank you all for listening. The Simply of Sound Doctrine, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, this is my YouTube channel, A-O-S-D-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. 118 subscribers. I need more. People subscribe and unsubscribe all the time. And my ideology is my ideology. My mentor is Mr. William Bell and all things fulfilled. If you find some discrepancy between what I say and what he say, please believe it's not intentional. Uh, but we all are grown. We all have our mindset. We all see the Bible different ways. So at the end of the day, he's my mentor. And I love him to death. And I learn from him because I feel like he's anointed. But I also do my due diligence to learn, study on my own to be approved and do the things that the Most High requires of me. So we have a great organization. If you want to learn, just let me know. But all that Hebrew Israelite doctrine, I love my brothers and sisters, but we got to come out of that. That's not what it is. That's American-made, uh, hatred-filled, Judaizers back doctrine. And we're here to say, hey, brothers and sisters, Let's get the correct understanding so we actually understand the kingdom of heaven so the Father can bless, bless us as a unit. All right. Oh, thank you, Brother Daniel, and I love your page, too. Y'all check out Brother Daniel right there, uh, Brother Daniel Orfield. He has some great things also on his YouTube page. Uh, he can put it down below, or you can hit him up, too. I mean, y'all, we have one powerful unit. We all learn from each other. We all teach. It ain't no color bounds. It ain't no, no racial tensions and all of that. Uh, brother uh, Daniel, uh, I, lo I love the brother to death, and he's been sticking there with me. And uh, even though that I'm polygynous, and he, he probably is not polygynous, and other people uh, might be not polygynous, and uh, we're all working together, and we're all understanding the Bible. We, understand, we, we separate opinion from the scriptures. And that's what it's all supposed to be about. If I choose to do one culture custom and he chooses not to do another, it shouldn't be no strife between the word of the Most High. And the brother hit me up the other day. He said, he said, my brother, they like you. The only part is 
you do polygyny. And this is why they can't support you. This is why they can't uh, bring you to their channels. This is why they can't support your movement or, or bring out the information or give you a shout out. Even though they want to, they can't because you practice polygyny. It is what it is. And I told them, I don't care. I'm in it for the most high. The most high bless me with an additional wife. Thank you, most high. I will take it. If I told him if it wasn't his will, let it not happen. It happened. It is what it is. So thank you all for listening in. This is my YouTube channel once again. Let's bring the kingdom of heaven to all. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.